Ancient Laodicea, a town located on a flat-topped hill, once a thriving city, now lies in ruins, awaiting a more thorough excavation than it has so far received. Located at the junction of several important trade routes, Laodicea is 77 kilometers from Philadelphia, al Shahir, and 150 kilometers from Ephesus. Of the several cities named Laodicea in Syria and Asia Minor, only one is mentioned in the scriptures, namely the one situated within the confines of Phrygia and Lydia. Laodicea is located near the modern city of Denizli. Overshadowed by the more spectacular nearby site of Hierapolis, Laodicea receives only the occasional busload of tourists who stop to view the remains of this city which once boasted, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Revelation 3:17. Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ in Turkey. Laodicea is south of the modern village of Goncali and north of the village of Eskihisar. Laodicea is situated 10 kilometers from Heriopolis and 16 from Colossae. Discovered in 1835 by W.J. Hamilton, the site of Colossae still awaits archaeological excavation. The visitor to the site will likely be disappointed, for not much can be seen at this once important city in the Lycus River Valley. On the south side of the river, right here, is a low mound, the site of the Acropolis of the ancient city of Colossae. On the sides and the top of the site, which can be quickly climbed, are a few scattered remains of building fragments. On the eastern side of the mound, the concave outline of the theater at Colossae is still discernible. To the north of the Lycus River was located the necropolis of the city, where several tombs with flat slabs have been discovered. On the other hand, Hierapolis, formerly Pamukkale, is a great place to visit. Long before the visitor arrives at Pamukkale, the gleaming white calcified cliffs attract attention. Looking like snow on a mountainside, these limestone formations are the result of calcium deposits from mineral-rich water that still flows over the cliffs. Perhaps the best way to visit the site is to begin at the Pamukkale Museum. Among the noteworthy objects are statues of the god of Hades, a relief of the marriage of Zeus and Leto, a relief of the birth of Apollo, and a relief of King Eumenes, of Pergamum, and reliefs of gladiators fighting. The exhibit also contains some objects found at Laodicea, including a statue of a priestess of Isis and a relief of Dionysus and Pan. Northeast of the museum is the Sacred Bull, a portion of the colonnaded street can be seen to the east of the Sacred Bull. The street, which was the major street of the city, ran north to south. Behind the Sacred Bull is the Nymphia, a monumental 4th century AD fountain that has been partially restored. The Nymphia is located in front of the Temple of Apollo. All the remains of these structures are the foundations, platform and entry steps. On the south side of the temple is an arched opening that leads to the Plutonia, the sacred cave believed to be the entrance to the underworld, the domain of the god Pluto. One of the most impressive structures at Heropolis is the Roman theater. The theater had a seating capacity of 12,000 to 15,000. Follow the dirt path north that goes beside the theater to reach the Martyrion of St. Philip, the Apostle, located north of the ancient city walls. For over a mile along both sides of the highway entering Heropolis are numerous tombs representing a variety of styles including sarcophagy, house and temple tombs, and tumulus tombs. This necropolis is one of the largest in Turkey, containing over a thousand tombs from the Hellenistic period to the early Christian period. 
South of the necropolis, past the North Baths, is a monumental entryway to the city known as the Gate of Domitian. The site of ancient Laodicea was partially excavated by Canadian archaeologists from 1961 to 1963. At the southern end of the site are the remains of the ancient aqueduct and stone water pipes that brought water into Laodicea. Note the heavy lime deposits in the pipes. The uh, pipes distributed water from this point to the various homes in the community. Adjacent to uh, the terminus of the aqueduct was a fountain and also the remains of a large building that was a gymnasium bath complex. To the west of the gymnasium bath are the ruins of a stadium, one of the most impressive remains at the site. The colonnaded street ran along the north side of the Nymphium. Uh, portions of the paved street as well as some of the column fragments are visible. Facing the street on the north side are the remains of a large complex with a courtyard that likely had porticos on its east, south and west side. A large building was at the north end of the complex. This complex, likely built after the middle of the 2nd century CE, was probably a temple dedicated to the imperial cult. Laodicea had five agoras, or assembly places. As an important city along a major trade route and with an extensive textile industry, the city evidently felt it needed all of these agoras for doing business, although one agora functioned as a political agora or forum. Laodicea has two theaters, one in the west, dated to the Hellenistic period, and a larger on the north, this one from the 2nd century AD. This theater, with a diameter of more than 120 meters, could hold more than 20,000 people. About 20 churches and chapels have been found in Laodicea. Some of these structures used to be private houses. Dated to the beginning of the 4th century AD, the largest church structure at Laodicea spanned a whole city block. The church was decorated with marble floors. In the middle of the nave is the speaker's podium. A platform and an altar, along with decorated chancel screens, sat at the far eastern end of the nave. Below the altar, archaeologists found a water basin and miniature bottles, which suggests that holy water was bottled and given to pilgrims. The baptistry of the Church of Laodicea features a cross-shaped font. The city of Laodicea was originally named Diospolis, the city of Jupiter, then Rhodes. The city had been founded as a major urban center around 250 BC by Antiochus II to be a gateway to Phrygia and was settled by Syrians and Jews brought from Babylonia. Antiochus named the city after his wife or sister, Laodice. After 188 BC, the city came under the rule of the Pergamenes. Laodicea came under the control of the Romans in 133 BC. Because of its favorable location on the system of the Roman roads, the city became one of the greatest commercial and financial centers of the ancient world. Laodicea was enormously wealthy and they were proud of it. When around 60 AD it was devastated by an earthquake, its citizens were so rich and independent that according to the Roman historian Tacitus, they refused imperial help and rebuilt the city using their own resources. Most of the city's wealth came from the clothing manufacturing industry and banking transactions. Laodicea was widely known for a fine quality of soft and glossy black wool used in the production of different kinds of garments and carpets which were exported all over the world. This commercial prosperity made the city a great banking center where a large quantity of gold was stored. In addition, Laodicea was famous for its medical school, which had a reputation throughout the ancient world for its treatment of eye diseases by the means of the eye salve made from Phrygian powder mixed with oil. The major weakness of Laodicea was its lack of an adequate and convenient source for water. Its location had been determined by the road system rather than by natural resources. Colossae was known for its cold, pure water, and Hierapolis in antiquity, as well as today, was noted for its hot springs, which provided water used for medical purposes, as well as for a hot drink. 
but the Laodiceans did not have an adequate water supply and had to resort to aqueducts to convey water to their city, either from Hierapolis or from Colossae. Such an aqueduct could easily be cut off, leaving the city helpless, especially in the dry season when the Lycus could dry up. By the time the water arrived at Laodicea, much of it was tepid and unpalatable, but they continued to use it. Laodicea was the center of the imperial cult and later received a temple wardenship under Commodus. The church in Laodicea was probably founded during the time Paul spent at Ephesus on his third missionary journey, perhaps by Epaphras. There is no evidence that Paul visited the church, although he wrote them a letter that was subsequently lost. The Christian community at Laodicea was closely connected with that of Colossae, and it's mentioned five times in Paul's letters to the Colossians. Laodicea formed a cluster with two others at Colossae and Hierapolis, and possibly with certain other house churches in the same general area. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, to the churches, Revelation 3, 14 to 22. The church at Laodicea was the last and worst of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Laodicea was the opposite of the Church of Philadelphia. As the Church of Philadelphia was rebuked for nothing, so the Church of Laodicea was commended for nothing. The state of the church in Laodicea was one of self-satisfaction and complacency. Apparently the Christians, like the city itself, enjoyed a high degree of comfort and prosperity, a factor that led to a diminished zeal for the things of God. And yet, this was one of the seven golden lampstands. A corrupt church may still be a church, and Jesus is still there. He stands at the heart's door of each believer and knocks requesting permission to enter in order to perform the miracle of salvation and transformation. This is the one letter in which the titles of Christ are not drawn from the description of Revelation 1. To the church of Laodicea, Jesus identifies himself with three titles. First, Jesus is the Amen. The word Amen comes to us from Hebrew via Greek and basically means in truth. According to Barclay, it was used to affirm and to guarantee a statement as absolutely true and trustworthy. This title reminds one of Isaiah 65, 16, where God is called the God of truth. In Hebrew, God of Amen. In the Gospel, Jesus often begins his statements with, Truly, truly, I say to you. Next, Jesus is described as the faithful and true witness. He presents the trustworthiness of Christ in sharp contrast to the unfaithfulness of the Laodicean Church. He is the witness that we can fully rely on. This is most likely what Paul had in mind when he said, For as many as are the promises of God, in Him they are yes. Therefore also through Him is our Amen to the glory of God through us. 
Finally, Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. The phraseology should not be misunderstood to suggest that Christ is a created being, but rather the one who begins or initiates the creation of God and has absolute authority over it. To the self-sufficient church in Laodicea, Christ introduces himself as the Amen of God, the faithful and true witness, the only one who has absolute power over the world because he is the source and origin of all creation. His faithful testimony exposes the true condition of the church falling away from him. Therefore, when he speaks, the church is to listen and obey. As you open your life to Christ, He will point out your real condition, and Jesus will guide you to the only answer you need, Himself. Christ knows that the Laodiceans are neither cold nor hot. The word cold is used for freezing water and hot for boiling water. The Laodiceans probably thought they could strike a middle road between worshiping God and worshiping the Roman Emperor. Jesus prefers that the church be either hot or cold. He intends simply that knowing definitely where they should stand, they stand there. The only reason Christ would prefer coldness to lukewarmness is that it symbolizes hypocritical profession of faith. They could not even be classed with the worldly people around them who had absolutely no concern about the things of Christ. It is worse to have believed and sunk into indifference about one's faith than to have had no faith from the start. So the lukewarm condition denotes compromise. Their lukewarm condition indicates that they have fallen into the status of indifference and self-sufficiency. They have lost their original enthusiasm and zeal for spiritual matters. Their lukewarm condition provides neither refreshment for the spiritually weary nor healing for the spiritually sick. Hemer points to a contrast of the Laodicean lukewarmness with the hot medicinal waters of Hierapolis and the cold, pure, life-giving waters of Colossae, concluding that the emphasis is on ineffectiveness instead of half-heartedness. The church is not being called the task for its spiritual temperature, but for the barrenness of its works. In any case, because the Laodiceans are lukewarm, Christ says, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. This is a figure of disgust and rejection. The glorified Christ will no longer tolerate such lukewarm, ineffective believers. They are like salt that has lost its saltiness, which will be thrown out as useless. This is a heart-searching message for this hour. There's a great division in Christianity today, and it's not in denominations, it's not in Romanism and Protestantism. The great division consists of those who believe in the Word of God and follow it, who, those who love it, obey it, and then those who reject it. That is the line of division today. Which side are you on? The Laodiceans are not condemned for apostasy or heresy. They're not being persecuted, yet Jesus finds no good thing to say about them. The only good thing in Laodicea is the church's thoroughly good opinion of herself, and that is false. She claims to have everything and has nothing. The main problem is her indifference. The church has been infected by the city's pride and self-sufficiency as expressed through their attitude I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. The city of Laodicea prided itself on its material wealth, clothing trade, and popular eye self. This spirit evidently crept into the church. The Laodicean Christians were putting their trust in their own wealth, yet they may have regarded it as a blessing from God, thus being deceived as to their true spiritual condition. Their pretentious claim was not only that they were rich, but that they had received it and achieved it all on their own. And beyond that, they had need of nothing. But the truth was that they were the ones who were poor, blind, and naked. While the church in Smyrna appears poor, yet in reality is rich, the Laodiceans think that they are rich 
while in reality they are poor in their spiritual pride. They are blind to their own condition and think themselves the opposite of what they really are. They are poor in reference to the true riches of life, blind in reference to truth and knowledge, and they are naked in reference to their utter lack of Christ-like character and genuine good works, which are the evidence of a truly spiritual life. The one who does not know and the one who is not aware that he does not know are both in the same precarious position. The sin that is most nearly hopeless and incurable is pride of opinion, self-conceit. This stands in the way of all growth. What do you think about yourself? No, no. What do you really think about you? Remember the first words of Jesus in the Sermon of the Mountain. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The divine response to their own unrecognized wretchedness is to counsel them to buy from Christ what is necessary to become what they think they are but are not in fact. They need to receive gold refined in the fire that stands figuratively for faith which has been tested. This gold comes not from the thing banks in their city but from Jesus himself. They need to put on Christ as their white clothes, not depending on the well-known black wool of the sheep in their fields. Their eyes must be enlightened by the Spirit, for their renowned eye salve had only left them blind. Jesus tells them, be earnest, be zealous, and repent. Still, Jesus uses the tender, personal word for love, phileo, when he issues his rebuke and discipline. He stands at the door of each individual's heart and asks invitation to enter. Jesus is standing before the door of every human heart and asking to be invited in for a meal of mutual and intimate love. He does not break in. He waits for you. What is your decision? Jesus promises to share his throne with the overcomers in the church, just as he overcame and sat with his father on his father's throne. The fulfillment of this promise will be realized after his return to earth. It is significant that while the number of promises to the other churches increases in proportion with the decline of their spiritual condition, Laodicea, as bad as it is, is given only one promise. However, this promise incorporates all other promises given to the churches. To sit with Jesus on his throne means to have everything. This letter is both the sternest of the letters and the most tender. And maybe this loving letter was not just for the church at Laodicea. Maybe it is for you and I as well. In this loving letter, Jesus Christ assures us all that we are beloved. Friend, he is not scolding you. He is pleading with you. He is challenging his beloved child because you mean so much to him and he cannot simply stand by and watch your downward spiral. In love, Jesus does not compel you to repent, but rather calls you to repent. You and you alone must open the door that your own lukewarmness has closed. Jesus Christ knocks. He respects your freedom to choose how you will respond. Only you can open the door. You may think that you are not worthy to open the door, that you have gone so far from God. But no matter where you are, friend, Jesus loves you. Softly and tenderly, he asks you to open the door. What will your answer be? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.
Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your encouragement in our lives. We thank you for speaking directly to the changes that need to become reality in our hearts. We pray especially, Lord Jesus, that, that you would give us the gift of repentance, that we, would, that we would love you with passion the way we first loved you when we received your grace at the beginning of our Christian journey. Father, continue to guide our lives. Make us a blessing to those around us that we would encourage others and that together with them, we would spend eternity with you. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us. Don't forget to share with your friends and relatives the quest for answers looking for the first followers of Christ here in Turkey. Don't forget to visit our website. On our website, you can send us a message, your prayer request, and as well, you can make your donation on our website. May God bless you, and I hope to see you soon.